On the same day that Prince Harry was in the High Court in London giving evidence, so too did a federal judge in the United States give the Department for Homeland Security until next Tuesday, so one week, to decide how it's going to deal with a request for Prince Harry's immigration records into the United States. The Heritage Foundation, of course, being specifically interested in what Harry said or didn't say with regard to his admitted drug use, the admissions coming in his uh, memoirs spare, and if he did mention those, what the department considered after that. Now, at a hearing going on on exactly the same day, on Tuesday in Washington, D.C., the federal judge, Carl Nichols, said it had until the 13th of June to determine whether or not it's going to expedite or respond to the request for those records. One of the arguments against it is that a person's immigration and visa is confidential. And attorneys for the department also said that an injunction to expedite the freedom of information request was not appropriate in a case that the Heritage Foundation, it says, among other things, has not shown how they will suffer irreparable harm if the information is not quickly released. Now, just to pause for thought on that for a moment, an injunction is normally granted either in a case where it is immediately important for something to happen or not happen, or that a party is going to suffer harm. But that is, of course, not the only reason for an injunction. An injunction could be if a party has refused to do something that they should do, or that the court finds a reason upon which to base the decision that they should do, and then so order that party to do that thing. In this case, reveal those documents. Now, the Heritage Foundation has quite obviously reiterated that they are only focused on the specific issue that has drawn all the press attention, which is the drug use. Uh, saying that that's all that he's talked about, referring to Prince Harry, of course. Um, obviously, that's not all he's talked about, but he's talked extensively about it, written about it extensively. And in doing so, the Heritage Foundation lawyers say he's waived any privacy interest in what he said has been his drug use, um, even going to the extent that he's bragged about it in his memoirs and sold the book to make profits, obviously. Now, just another point there as well. There are a number of ways, even if that privacy and privilege existed in those documents, there are a number of ways that privilege can be waived. For example, uh, this will particularly interest those of you that are either law students interested in doing law or more still, you are on the bar course. I know some of you are because I teach at the bar school sometimes and I know some of you watch this, so hello. Um, so some of you that are studying law will be interested about the proof of evidence document that a defendant, at least in England and Wales, produces with their solicitor. And that document is entirely privileged, meaning it is not uh, disseminated, given out to the other side, and certainly not to the jury, so that they can see everything that the defendant said to their solicitor. But moreover, you cannot refer a defendant to it during live examination, because it's a privileged document. It's a document for the lawyers to understand the case as to what's going on. And if you do attempt to memory refresh your defendant client from their proof of evidence, you are impliedly going to waive privilege to that document. And then that document will be given to the jury, which is quite likely going to be detrimental to that defendant's case. But in a similar fashion, in civil cases, if someone were to want to sue a lawyer for, let's say, negligence on a piece of advice that they've provided, as in the lawyers provided, obviously. If they wanted to sue that lawyer to say that the advice was negligent and bring a civil claim, the only way the court can really decide whether that advice was negligent is to look at the advice. And then it becomes part of the open court record. So there too, there is case law that the entirety of the advice, or at the very least, the portion of which is being complained of, is going to be waived in terms of the privilege, and it's likely to be the entirety of the advice, because the way we structure these advices is a detailed set of chron chronological facts, what happened, and then an assessment of the law obviously with conclusions and next steps and recommendations at the end. So if any of those, if the analysis of the law was wrong, or the conclusion was wrong, or the next steps were wrong, for example, if a lawyer 
encouraged you to sue the wrong party and then you lost the opportunity to sue the correct party because they've given you wrong information. You may have a claim for loss of chance, but the only way then to find out what the advice said is to look at the advice. So coming full circle back to Harry's case here, on the one hand, there is an argument by the department that this information is private, but running counter to that argument is that a lot of this information, if not all of it, has been publicized and sold in the form of books and uh, Netflix documentaries and so on. And furthermore, rather ironically, as you'll hear about in lots of my previous videos about Harry's case in the High Court in London this week, which is still ongoing, his claims against a UK publisher, Mirror Group Newspapers, alleging unlawful uh, and illegal information gathering methods in the way that they sourced their stories and information. Well, For more on so one of the things that I wanted to pick up on first of all was a comment that said, and I, th I feel it deserves answering, the comment said, you do realise that Prince Harry is not on trial. Now of course he's not, it is Harry's claim along with those of others, this being a test case. Now the reason for the comment, I presume, is because of the comments and discussion around Prince Harry being cross-examined and how difficult this must be for him to be cross-examined on every intimate detail of stories dating back to 1996. Because so you'll see several full videos of uh, both myself and some with Alan Robertshaw discussing Prince Harry's trial in some great detail on how it was structured, why the journalists have not been in court and why they are not being questioned and some general guidance on how cross-examination works. But in this video, if you wanted just a brief overview of the strategy that's being used by King's Counsel in cross-examination against Prince Harry, this video is for you. So there are essentially three lines of attack, if you will, against Prince Harry, all of which started after a fairly soft introduction, uh, which is a nice way of putting uh, Harry at ease before actually going in for some seriously damaging cross-examination. For more on that, there's a whole lot of videos linked in the playlist in the description below. But at the moment, the Department of Homeland Security has until Tuesday to decide how it's going to respond to this request and whether or not it's going to release those records. Otherwise, it's probably safe to say that there's going to be more developments and more intervention by the court, because this will also need to be answered one way or another. So that's today's update, which is a couple of days overdue because of all the other legal updates. It's been a busy week. Uh, please make sure you hit that like button and subscribe and the notification bell so you get updates and notifications. You can ignore the ones you don't want to watch, but if you hit that notification bell, it helps me because it tells YouTube you like to watch my videos and I'm very grateful. So in the meantime, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.